Welcome to my mini-series on hip range of motion, where we will explore why each person's hip joints have different capabilities. My goal is to shed light on why you may struggle to achieve deep stretching poses or you feel limitations within your hip in dynamic movements earlier than others do. Spoiler alert, this has little to do with spiritual advancement or how hard you practice and everything to do with the biomechanics of your joints. While dedication and regular stretching will improve flexibility and reduce muscle tightness, anatomical limits are generally set by our bone structure and joint mechanics. For this video and for the sake of clarity, let's define hip range of motion with the maximum extent of movement that you can do in each direction. As a reminder, here are the general movements that you can do. Flexion is how far you can bring your thigh towards your torso. Extension is how far you can move your leg backwards away from your body. Abduction measures the maximum distance you can lift your leg away from the body's midline. Adduction indicates how far you can bring your thigh back towards or even across the body's midline. Internal rotation is the maximum angle at which you can rotate your femur inward. And then there's external rotation, which is the maximum angle at which you can rotate your femur outwards. Often these movements combine in various ways, such as flexion is combined with abduction and an internal rotation and so forth. The maximum range for each combined movement can also vary significantly depending on your individual bone structure. You may ask yourself, what does he mean with bone shapes? Let's take the pelvis as an example, which can vary in several ways. It can be wide or narrow, or it can also be tilted or rotated, either forward or backwards. Or let's look at the femur. It can also vary widely in its configuration. For example, the length of the femoral neck and the angle at which it connects to the femur can differ greatly. Additionally, something often overlooked is the amount of torsion within the femur itself which can cause the femoral neck to be twisted either forwards or backwards relative to the pelvis. So let's dive even deeper and let's add two more important factors for flexion that we haven't mentioned so far, which is the depth and the orientation of the hip socket. Looking at the pelvis from the front, notice the difference between a shallower and a deeper acetabulum. A shallower acetabulum allows for a greater range of motion because the femoral head is less covered, providing more movement space. In contrast, the deeper acetabulum increases stability but limits range of motion, as the femoral head contacts the acetabulum rim sooner, reducing joint space and flexibility. Now let's examine the orientation of the acetabulum. On screen you can see what it looks like when the hip socket is oriented towards the front and I also added a change of depth. On contrary, you can see what it looks like when the acetabulum is oriented more towards the back. Again, you see a change of depth. Let's bring back the femur and let's have a look at how both of these factors look when they are put together. You can see a forwards oriented hip socket with changes of depth and then an anterior hip socket also with changes of depth. I hope this gives you a better understanding of the characteristics that we try to put together for hip flexion. Now let's apply the knowledge we've gathered to a real life example that many of you have likely encountered. A forward stretch. First, let's consider a person with a shallow and more anteriorly oriented hip socket. They can easily achieve a deep bend with a flat back because their bone structure simply allows it, assuming that they don't have tight hamstrings. Let's compare this to someone with a deeper hip socket that's oriented towards the back. For this person, bending forward is much more difficult because the bone structure causes restrictions sooner, forcing them to compensate by rounding the upper back to reach further. If you're a trainer, you've probably seen this scenario countless times. Many people instinctively try to create more space for movement by spreading their legs or rotating them outwards. While they might feel a limitation, they often don't realize that the hard stop they are encountering are their bones making contact. For some, these adjustments work because their bone structure allows it to create the extra space needed for greater range of motion. This reality that your bone structure dictates how deeply you can move into certain positions can be challenging, especially in disciplines like gymnastics, dance or yoga, where the focus is on achieving a specific external alignment. 
However, what looks ideal on the outside doesn't always mean your joints are moving in a way that's optimal or safe internally. So experiment, even if you are told differently. I think this is enough information for you to process. I want to thank you for joining me in this exploration of how our unique bone structures influence movement. Remember, understanding your body's natural limits is key to training smarter and safer. So next time you're stretching or working on your form, keep in mind that not all movement limitations can be overcome with practice. Sometimes it's just the way you're built. Stay tuned for more insights in the next video and as always comment your thoughts down in the comment section. If you want to add me on Instagram, I'm happy about it. And also you can visit my shop for some awesome wall art. Have a good one.